We live in a world which is crazy about numbers. And when I refer to the, the, the term big data, big data just means there's a load of technologies now, wearable tech, the way people are connected to apps, iPads, technology has infiltrated the world of sport. Um, the way you can amass huge quantities of data and communicate that very quickly has become part and parcel of elite coaching in terms of performance analysis. At one end, we can say, yeah, I don't have any issues with performance analysis by the end. I think it's a real good measurement tool. Um, I think it provides sustenance, but I think people should measure adaptivity rather than measuring the same old kind of sterile things. So it's good, but it's similar, if I think about the other end of that continuum, I think when there's hyper surveillance, it's having problems on the way people play the game. It's having problems on the way it's reshaping the game. And it's having problems in terms of players' experiences, lived implications and consequences of being watched 24-7. So this is a kind of narrative which was born a couple of years ago. And I'm gonna link this to obviously the main theme of um, this conference, if you like, high performance coaches, a technocratic process or learning activity. I think the coaching role is changing because co coaches, it depends what coaching is to you. And I'm just going to work through some points from yesterday, which came from the table so we can kind of couch this presentation in essentially you guys and your experiential learning. So I'll bring the research in. It's about you guys, your coaching experiences. And we'll put that together and we'll have some really good fertilization in terms of knowledge and moving forward. Big issues which came out yesterday. Training is too structured. This notion of adaptive players, okay? And some of the stuff Corris said about turnovers in this country. Players being able to recapture the ball, turn the ball over, and then, again, transition into attack. Again, the stats are very poor. This idea about not overcomplicating things. Players who can play something different. We want to create learning environments where we can, if you like, encourage decision making. Encourage risk, perhaps. We want to develop intelligent players who are decision makers, as Kevin said, under pressure. Elite sporting context in rugby where people are afraid to try things. Okay, this overload in terms of feedback. Players, we want players to have creativity. And there's an emphasis, again, on these learning environments. So everything I'm going to speak about today is essentially about those themes which have come from you guys. We did a video with Sky Sports um, about a year ago. Graham Simmons came up. We looked at this issue with a, a, a premiership coach. And I'm going to play that. And we we'll probably break out for a round. Because, again, I want you guys, I want you guys' opinions on some of these issues. I'm not standing up here. And I don't have to come across that I'm standing up here as the expertologist in all this. This is about me presenting the research and you guys making your minds up about what's good and what's bad. You coach in your context. You are the experts. I'm not trying to kind of... And I'm trying to force people down any avenue in terms of the way they think about this, okay? Some of our work was originally picked up and it was unfortunately used to bash England. But I'm kind of wondering how much it affects you guys. And I know we've got some elite players, elite coaches. I'd be very interested to think about what happens in your context. But there's three questions we're going to return to. Uh, probably around 10 o'clock. But hey guys, I'm non-linear. Whichever way this goes, it goes. Is performance becoming blindly optimized just for the sake of it and we think about coach learning we think about being professional is it just something which is there and we have to use the technology so what does coaching mean to you a big thing yesterday was relationship building your philosophy of coaching is it about helping people is it about developing people through understanding them or is it just about Forget about the social to social interaction, this social technological relationship. We just go straight to the technology. And we've forgotten about people in this. So what are the effects of endless evaluation and monitor on the players? And is the art of coaching, coming back to coaching process, being lost in the noise of high tech, big data, technocratic activity? Lots of data amassed, big issues with it. The counter narrative is what's being presented this morning. Otherwise, we think it's the gold standard in terms of elite sport. Loads of knowledge, loads of performance analysis. That's really, really good. And in my coaching experiences, there's some guys I've worked with who've been involved in professional clubs. And I've had these conversations with them. And I said, look, how much analysis do you do? Oh, we don't do that much because we can't afford it. At the top end, guys can afford it. And they're doing stacks of it. So just questioning that. Okay, guys? But again, not the expertologist. 
It's up to you guys to draw a conclusion. And I come back to something really important. It's about more questions and answers, just to reiterate what Kevin was speaking about last night. Now, the way this is going to work um, is these are the characters in this book. Because I'm a social scientist, if you like. So what's important to me is understanding people. So people in, in an environment, in a context where we were talking to guys for two years, 10 players, the captain, the new head coach, when the old one was sacked or moved to a different position because of his heavy surveillance practices. So these are stories. I think stories are really good for coach learning because they mobilize knowledge and people can understand it. Okay, traditional research, tables, graphs, statistics, it's quite difficult to interpret that, difficult to translate that into practice. So we're gonna go with a storied theme this morning. These are the characters in the book and this is what they said about surveillance practices. But first of all, we're gonna watch this clip. A couple of people may have seen this, it's something we've done with Sky Sports and it hits many of these issues on the head. After it's over, we're gonna break out um, and we'll have probably a couple of minutes on your tables doing a round. And if I can get some of your feedback, anything this throws up for you, okay? It's a big issue, guys. For me, in terms of coaching, in terms of sport, this is the hot button subject. Rugby union is so quantified. Carries, meters, skills, tackles, and that's just scratching the surface any game match day at any given club. Sports science is taking the game to new levels. And at such a pace that even the students operators initially were too far. This club has never really sort of fell in my sort of because they thought that was the way of making it successful. Didn't have a clue how to use it. And when I came in, I was immersed in something that nobody had a clue how to use. So I was sort of swallowed up by the numbers and the graphs, and I was just going back and said, Ooh, if I don't understand it, it doesn't work. Was to worry it's maybe a championship sign, but backstage, the setup is totally fresh. And nowadays, all the numbers they crunch have whys and wherefores. Every morning, every player fills in a well-being survey. How you sleeping, eating, where does it hurt? Hydration scores are a daily chore. Blood tests measure neuromuscular fatigue, saliva tests look at stress levels, and heart monitors and GPS open a window to every place. Physiological program. Everybody's looked at you know, meters used, meters gained in every session, and you know, actually, it's probably one of the least important things that we look at these days. You know, we're more interested in you know, high, high intensity accelerations, the accelerations, because they're the real fatiguing factors. You know, aligned with the blood testing, we're doing saliva testing, the monitoring mechanisms. But the crucial fact for me is, is whoever's interpreting that data has to be the best in the field. We have some players who's uh, meters per minute and everything else all lower than everyone else for some of our best players. So when you're looking at that, if you get a basically an analyst come in and say, well, it's not burning at all. But actually, we look at the actual life game, he is, because it reads the game better than everyone else. He doesn't do dead marks, he sits and waits, he makes the game come back to himself. There's no data set for that. What's the candidate you reckon it's taken them three years to wade through the blizzards of numbers and make sense of them? The key being for the coaches to run the data and not the other way Again, I think there's this um, misinterpretation that we're all sat in there with computers going, shh, shh, right, number three is ready to come off, he's done his 100 units for the week. I mean, if he's killing his car, I don't care where he's blowing, he's staying out there. If it was to have sweated long and hard to get the balance right, others appear to be struggling. Here at Bath University, Sean Williams has been looking long and hard. Data valence, indeed, he and his colleague, Andrew Manley, asked four players at a premiership club, what they made of all the data they dealt with. These are the players' words, but not their voices. The coaches are watching you. Anything they can make a statistic out of, they will. The coaches base everything on key performance indicators. They say your KPIs are 60%, and the other guy in your position is 70%, and that's why we're picking it. The head coach encourages people to speak their mind, but no one does. You can't argue with the stats. Every step you take is videoed and analysed. If you're not adhering to body fast stats, you're breaching contract, and in the red room, the coaches play mind games. I wouldn't put it past them to read private diaries that players are encouraged to keep. You're expected to log in from your laptop at home, and they see when you log in. They monitor what you're watching and how often you log in. The coach is the main man and he's got 15 robots and they're all doing what he says. I don't like it. I don't think he gets the best out of you. 
institutions that tend to be data-led uh, are those that are dictating players and their actions to the point where they may not take risks on the pitch. Um, uh, they might shy away, uh, and they might remain silent, uh, and they're not want to speak up or speak out. Is the coaching world changing so people, I guess, become, coaches become more technocratic? Are they technocratic engineers? I mean, where's the people in this? Um, is it more about you know, the data leading institutions? Or is more about people in the institutions. Four players from one squad in one team in one league isn't obviously the most quantitative sample. More research is on the way, but clearly the suspicion is that some countries are becoming enslaved by the numbers game. Form almost becomes preordained in meetings on a Thursday, a Friday, and players are taking a free to play now that they play in certain numeric variables and they start analytical movement whether they will reach these performance indicators. By focusing on this very limited or narrow um, uh, sort of range of skill sets, then what you're actually doing is perhaps eliminating talent from your uh, young pool. Um, in effect, you're institutionalizing rugby players to the point where uh, real talent perhaps get, goes on this. You can always predict almost what the next play is going to be. Team one of those possessions, full of territory, and they things we can, we can measure. I mean, the, the assumption is that we can make it, we can make it better. But I think we, you know, can we put people's impulses into a laptop? All this, you sense, says more about bad coaching than bad data. Use the numbers wisely, as Worcester have learned to do, and you can create programs which help to improve fitness levels, tailor training loads, improve injury prevention rates, and empower growth. Turn the players into risk averse robots, however, and you're in trouble. Well, unless you try it, you're going to sit and let everyone overtake you and everything else. And just, you can't sit still in this sport. You've got to be looking at things and you've got to be trying the, the bits that it is supporting. But remember why we were here in the first place. And if you lose that balance, sometimes I can understand how some of the criticisms come in. In the right hands, the data revolution could take this sport to new levels of elite performance. Mishandled? And it could yet kill the game stone dead. But we need to be very, very careful where it's going. Okay guys, just food for thought. Again, more questions and answers. If we just break out now, we'll have a round. Okay, so we two, three minutes. Um, and then if somebody can speak back, any issues. Again, think about your own experiences, guys. Let's drag you into this, okay, this context. Okay, off you go, guys. Players felt. Um, for the next three or four slides, I'm going to read the players' views, remember the narrative, the storybook, um, and then I've got some audio. It's not the actual coaches who were involved in the study or the, ed, uh, the, the captain who was involved in the study. Again, people ask me, oh, who's the team, who's the team? If we just put that to one side at the moment, because it's not important, and I once, me and Keith were working with the AS around some of this stuff, and there was one guy at the front, and he was, he, was, he had the 12 premiership coaches, and he was trying to cross them off, you know, it was a game of deduction. Let's just take away the key messages because of the ethics of the research process. I can't say who it is, but it's just the messages I want to get across. So this idea about losing trust, um, treating people as robots, and again, coming back um, to what the kind of philosophy of coaching could be, or maybe should be, around developing certain types of players. Every day, every minute is magnified. That's your stats report. Okay, there it is for the last seven games. So again, it's this removal of human interaction because coaches are quite happy, and maybe it's because of the size of huge premiership squads now, to give guys a report, and they don't have to necessarily converse with them, understand them, develop a relationship, because it's the stats which govern this numerical reality in clubs. And <coughs> we finished this paper, we only talked to four guys, okay, let's remember that, but those four guys, different levels, academy, British Lions, England player, um, living with other players in the club, Despite the fact we've talked to 10, head coach, performance analysis, we've talked to the um, rugby director as well, is that this has kind of become saturated now, and there's nothing I wouldn't take back, even though we've got more data. But we kind of argued that this uprise in technology, this step change in elite coaching, is absolutely threatening the environment for learning, because it's dictating to players so much what they should do on the field of play. Um, and we moved forward. And some of our recent stuff, sorry, is looking at big data, again, capturing data, communicating at speed, the control it gives coaches and organizations over players, so they become fearful, these cultures of fear, they risk averse, 
and how then we'll end the, the next part of this presentation with looking at what happened once that coach was removed from that role, the technocrat if we like, and a new coach was put in charge and they kind of lived through learning about what went wrong in the last regime, how they changed things, how they fixed the culture. So we'll draw on some, some lessons there, which could be good technically. And again, anything as we move through, just open it up, guys. It's up to discussion. It's as interactive as, as we want to be, okay? I'm not about pathologizing coaches. Okay, coaches do a great job, but I just think there's a bit of lack of critical awareness in terms of using technology. Well, Dave Thorburn was the director of rugby, who was very much stat space. So every area had four or five key performance indicators. Attack, probably six or seven. Nine outs, two or three. So you ended up having about 20. And he worked it out that for each KPI, if you reached that goal, that line went to green. If you didn't, it went to red. And if you had 65% green, then you won really easily. 50%, it was like you could still win. But anything under 50%, so like 45%, and you would probably lost. I guess that's, that's the machine mentality in action there. And when I say machine mentality, I mean, many years ago, Fordism, Taylorism, production line, people do simple, menial tasks, and when you get to the end and the car is built, there's no thinking, there's no engagement, there's nothing cognitive, you're just told what to do, everything's simplified, stripped down to its bare minimum, and we get a product, we get an output. And so we asked players about this, and I termed this the irrationality of the rationality, because even when they would get above, say, 80%, 70%, which in the coach's eyes was the green, you win games, they were losing games. And the other number there at the bottom line, say 35 40%, even when they were coming below that, they were winning games. So this, had a, this, this argument, this plausibility, was problematic in the minds of players. <laughs> and I'm going to read this bit out, because this is the players. Even when we won, it wasn't good enough, which was something that annoyed a lot of the guys. We were winning and winning, and we still didn't feel like we were getting the praise for it. And it goes back to the stats, where he, the coach, was using the data. The coach literally had for everything in the game, for every single thing in the game, it was like accurate passes, tackles, impact tackles, he had a percentage where he thought we should be at. So even when we were beating teams, there was an overall percentage of everything. And if we were above that, if he thought we were above that, and we would definitely win a game. If we were below it, it wasn't good enough. But we were beating teams, and we were below it. So it got kind of awkward, trying to sell players time and time, this idea that if they reach these targets, that this would be the outcome. Create uncertainty. Like, can we kind of ask that question? Can we really, think about the multi-dimensional nature of rugby. Can we create certainty? Or should we be better preparing people for uncertainty, which replicates the game? in its full sense. Again, if there's anything people want to come in, just say me, guys, okay? So this machine mentality, this playbook culture. A great tweet by a very distinguished coach recently. Thicker playbooks equal thicker players. But that's the culture we have now, guys, okay? Because we can measure it. So they, they play in for the stats. This is a way now, again, this machine mentality, how it's controlling people's actions in this organization. Remember, the bottom line is these are guys who are going to work and they, they want to enjoy themselves. They enjoy playing rugby. They put up on the screen throughout pre-season how many balls the guys have dropped and how many guys were not wanted to be in position to carry the ball just because they make your stats look better. Sorry, what's your name? Yeah, Dan. Again, that links to Dan's point. I mean, there's a number of players echoed this. They'd have training and they wouldn't turn up to carry, they wouldn't turn up in certain positions because they know if they made a mistake, it'd be on that leaderboard. And the leaderboards throughout the club, on every different stat, in your faces, made very public, and you just embedded, deeply embedded. You become immersed in that culture. So you were playing for the stats, I guess. Again, trying to understand how players' actions were coming around. Yeah, exactly. I think when it's as individual as that, then it's negative because you know what he, the coach, did say to us was, look, I didn't want you to be afraid to try things. If you drop it, the mindset is next play. Let's just move on to the next play. The next thing, don't worry about it. But that wasn't good enough though, because you see some guys at the top of the list, and it would be highlighting the meeting as well, so they'd just be there with their heads down saying, oh fuck, 
I dropped six balls pre-season. It doesn't look good. So again, they, they didn't enjoy feeling statistical. They're rugby players. They go into work. They wanted to feel practical. So we had some issues which come out of the data. And this is a great line, and it was from an academy player who had just transitioned to the first team, and an ex-British lion gave him this line, and verbatim he gave it to us, which I think is kind of some stats up in terms of coaches manipulate the data. Stats are like a bikini. What you can see is adjusted, but what you can't see is essential. And I use this, and it also ties into another issue, which has come up in some of the group stuff there, guys, is that two hookers, I don't know, they get paid 150 grand each. He was academy, he was on 20 grand. His stats were better than theirs. His stats were much better than theirs. But which player was were they picking? Because they had to justify the economic, um, the economic payout for the players. So the kind of the coaches were using the stats again, yes, to manipulate the decisions up as in terms of selection to justify that, but also it didn't make sense to the players living in this numerical reality. So manipulating stats, it's very easy. Whatever the stats are, to manipulate them in some way, for example, to drop a player. So give you guys coach, you know, it's, it's a power relationship, isn't it? It's ingrained in that relationship. So this is like a power relationship now on steroids with the data. Because you've got all this artillery to, be, to build a stick, a stick, a bigger stick, which you can bash people with and justify everything. So you can dress stats up very nicely to look at what you think. I'm very much aware of how you can make statistics appear a certain way to certain people and manipulate them. There's not many teams, groups, organizations, I say, who achieve a lot without trust. Okay? And trust was undermined. The players didn't trust the stats. But it's very difficult to argue with the stats. But then you know whichever stats were presented, paint the picture, the he former head coach, what he painted. You know he'd be like, I promise you. 95% of tries are scored from within the opposition's half, so why the hell are we running from our own half? Interested to see some of the footage, uh, goes back a while, but some of those great tries, some of the ambition of the players, and it's been kind of, it's been drilled out to people, you know? Um, this machine mentality is taking hold, and unfortunately, it's stripping away, it's soiling, the learning environments where people are not prepared to try things. And I guess we're all about coaching, learning, and that's the essence of what I'm trying to talk about really, guys. Yes, about stats, but ultimately it's about how it undermines people's development. This is the captain. I'm just gonna play this one, guys, okay? So this was a figurehead of the club, someone hugely respected, really set the tone off the field and on the field. So this is a, a really good conversation we had, okay, about trying to change this machine mentality. I had conversations with the head coach on Dorbert as to how we can manage it and do it a bit better. And it became clear that we were not getting the best out of people. Was he willing to listen? Not a huge amount, no. Because that's his way. He invited me in and brushed it off. So again, it's a very difficult place to be. And over time, I'm trying to map a process here, which ultimately led to the breakdown of relationships, it led to poor performance, and, and, and it was a very detrimental environment to be in, in terms of players' psychology. So we were playing away, and we lost the game, but the boys were playing in their own part, keeping the ball, getting the seeds. You know what I mean? And I said to the head coach, Paul Bon, we need to kick this right. So we tried to get the message on about trying to kick it, but because we were a tell environment, and we didn't train players to make their own decisions, they were too scared of doing anything else. So that's the new head coach looking back at the old regime. I'll just click straight onto this one. They didn't have Scooby. They didn't have Scooby. They didn't have a feel for the game. The feel of the game, in simple terms, is we had no ball, right? And what we should have done, they should have recognised that we had no ball. But we tried to keep hold of the ball, and these were the decisions we were making. But they didn't even recognise that they had no ball. They go home and watch the video, and Monday morning they would have said, yeah, we had no ball. But I wanted to recognise it during the game. I mean, is there any thoughts on that? I mean, you've got to remember, these are just numbers. The, the problem isn't the data. You know, if that table held up a five, if those guys held up a seven, it doesn't mean anything, okay? It's the interpretation of the data, and that's where the culture comes in, 
coach again setting the tempo for that culture by having such a statistically led operation become very problematic and we were about decision making i wonder if keith or rick sorry to put you on the spot guys any comments because we're trying to align what we're going to do today guys obviously keith and rick are going to are going to speak about you know what we do when we're on the grass creating great decision players uh, decision makers but then we look at what's happening off the field and how that baggage then gets carried on to the field. Thank you, Keith. Uh, in the room, do you see uh, performance analysis and statistical measure as a tool or a science? Because I think in the video, uh, people were talking about it as if it was a good sort of science. Well, I have people a long time ago in the UK in uh, academic sports science that performance analysis was a very wonderful and useful methodology, but it's not a science because what, what it needs as well is to be integrated with a theory. So I guess for me, the question uh, to raise for people in the in the room would be, what are the, what's your model of learning? Let's strip it back to that. When you, Take a coaching session or you work with the players, uh, development level, elite level. What is your model of learning? And, uh, what's your model of the learning process? How do you think the players are learning and that you are helping them to learn? And then how do those numbers actually help you with that model of learning? Do you have a model of learning? I'm sure you do. Uh, but can you articulate it? And where do the numbers fit? So it's kind of, for me, listening to this sort of very similar to Pasco to hear comments, is how does this, how does this, this, this discussion impact on your model of learning? And how do, how do you then articulate that practically in a practical environment? Right, yeah, thank you, Keith. I mean, who do we blame for these responses? I mean, the players have just died in the world every day they're just adjusting themselves they're adapting to that kind of culture which is eminent to the parameters of the game have an impact. Of course they do. So, you know, because of WIE, it's how many instances you have in a game. For example, as a type 5, we would say that we're outside of 50 metres as a pitch. So you stay in that area, and then anywhere that's out here, we're not involved in. So if you're playing a wide, wide game, you might touch the ball one seventy-five times or so, your WIE is rubbish. <laughs> and if you go outside, so I mean, again, you've got to think about this lock-in contractually, the big data lock-in. Uh, a big issue which is arising at the moment, there's been some, some, some comments from America that, who owns the data? Is it you with data, players? So I think some NFL players have just signed a contract so that they own the data. But you guys will know in terms of recruitment, the data which comes through about players is really important. And it's used as a yardstick to sign new players. But these guys are sitting down in contractual negotiations and the management are coming back and saying, well, actually, your work efficiency index is low. So we're only going to pay you this much. But it's like, yeah, well, what are we supposed to do? Because we're just playing the team game. We're playing the playbook. So they caught in no man's land. Player motivation. You kind of didn't look forward to a Monday very much. Because even if you won, you could still be bothered. And you could be one of your things outside. You know, I just think it was like, I've played rugby for 15 years in lots of different teams. Some of them have been really shit, and some of them have been really, really good. Um, and I think when you've got a really, really good team, like we have here, with high quality individuals, it's too limiting to tell them what to do. And then give them a green or a red. You've got guys in this team now who have got the ability to be the best player in the world. So you can't say to them, go out there and do this every time you get a because they're going to get bored. If they get it wrong, they're going to come in and get followed. And then it's like, well, what's the point? So I guess we, again, are mapping this kind of transition to a place which is a bit of a dark place. 
our players ultimately become broken. So the senior players, Tom, Dick and Harry, got broke throughout the week. They were like, it's just no point arguing. And I got the feedback from that. It's in the feedback. We do an exit interview with players, you know when they leave. And that was it, they just said. I give up, I give up. I'm just better off keeping my head down and doing as I'm told. Yeah, yeah, fear. They have no player ownership, always being told what to do, no enjoyment. Ultimately, we play, not the ball, don't you? Players enjoy having the ball in their hands, and so we're completely different. So I guess players got to this stage where data, big data, was an organisational stressor and players were just emotionally exhausted. After a sprightly start winning games, the data took hold and it just reduced guys to this. Um, and look, <laughs> I think people look at this sometimes and they think, well, it's kind of a bit of a namby-pamby narrative. I'm not about duty of care, I'm about learning and development. Um, and I think there's some real harsh lessons to learn from this and I think this idea of stress um, if you have to go to work every day and you have to espouse your values about how you think the, the game should be played but how you want to play you have to ignore that in every day that becomes a psychological grind and over time that takes hold you know forget these stress models which are very linear and they block this sums and this sums and this sums think about the context of having to go to work every day and not being happy over a considerable period of time. And the issue with, with lots of data is, when teams are losing, when things are going wrong, management often then choose, and there's a desire then, as earnest, earnest students of measurement, is to measure more. And then this creates more issues within the environment. But I'm just gonna finish up with a couple of points. Um, about a change in culture because that coach left the club and immediately there was a change the trust was restored the players were made to feel like they were kind of welcome at the club and we don't have that much access to the data anymore where it used to be a kpi card for every match every stat and i think it's about what you're measuring but what's very important is who gets to see the data, okay? So as a coach, you're a kind of a filtering device for deciding actually what's good, what's bad data, and what goes out to the teams. The players do more analysis of their own now because they don't want to let each other down. So this is more about a social connection. You know, it's like beers in the bar. That's where real learning takes place. Just this connection which was created because people worked through, through the issues and the problems they had themselves. These guys are closest to the action. These guys are experts, yeah? And a bit of support from above, they guys come up with some new analysis around thinking about adaptive change. So if they were playing this team on Saturday, the coaches would present the problem, the players would then work on that all week, and the coaches just went up on the scaffolding and they adopted more of a role of facilitation, okay? Because the idea is that in terms of the measurements, to show they are getting better, that was based on their practice through the week. So motivation, trust was installed, and they got rid of these needless sort of efficiencies which are just bogging everybody down. So the pressure to perform was higher, but ultimately not stats driven. And I come down to my ideas about stress, okay? Stress isn't caused by pressure. Stress is called, really I think, by the way people have to ignore their true values about what they are, what they want to do. So they weren't lying in bed on a Sunday night and thinking what was the percentage of lineups we got and how's that going to look on the game plan on a Monday. I mean, there's, there's an issue, right? And it's going to, I don't know if people are aware of it, I think it's going to be a bigger issue in terms of duty of care. But if you, some of these guys are getting 93 messages a day on their phone, right? You tuned into your app, one player deleted the, the player server off his app and he wasn't at that club for much longer because essentially rejected the culture. But then you're out with your wife, or you're out with your kids, whatever you're doing, you're not enjoying life. And then something comes through, you've got to look at these clips, you've got to feed back by tomorrow. And you're going to work, leaderboard then, a table with the guys who fed back and what time everything came in. So there was almost like surveillance on themselves. So it was a bit, yeah, it was at the extreme end, I admit. But I think these things are gonna take hold. 
Because you've got to think about coaching, you've got to think about your biographies. Who are you as a coach? Most of you have learned from other people. Okay? And this is, if this is going on in elite sport, and this is where it's going to go as technology becomes cheaper, and everybody thinks it's the gold standard, there are some real issues, I think, um, which are a player. So players weren't allowed to split themselves, if you like, to be a work self and a home self. 24-7, you were being watched because they were always connected to the organisation. Give guys a break, you know, they'd be better for it. There's this idea in professional sport that we have to own people for them to be better. It was interesting when we were down in Wellington a couple of weeks ago to you that the Toji was, um, was working on an assignment, an academic assignment, the day before England played Ireland. You know, distraction, education, they're good things. Otherwise, we just don't have any perspective, we kind of lose that. And finally, before I wrap things up, I want these guys to figure it out. This is what the new head coach said in terms of this change in culture. When someone's trying to knock your head out, your heart rate's at 180, the crowd and the emotion, you know if I want that on a Saturday, I've got to facilitate that through the week. So we don't tell them anymore, we don't tell them anything. So we become from very much a tell environment to a player-led environment. And I guess, you know, that kind of gets a bit cheesy, doesn't it? But I think with that cheese, there's a lot of substance in that, in terms of giving players the autonomy, certainly in terms of decision making, certainly in terms of overcoming this overbearing technocratic role. And I just want to think about a couple of things really. This idea about performance indicators and the machine mentality. Green dot. It could be anything, creativity, decision-making, intelligence. Players will ignore that. They become risk-averse robots in this study. Two years' time, talking to quite a lot of people, saturated at data level, because they're just going, they're just going to chew up all the orange stuff, because it's easy stuff. And I was talking, when we were also in Wellington, there was an um, ex-Bristol player, retired now, top tackler in the Premiership about five years ago. And he was saying, that's exactly how I kind of control myself on the field is I made a tackle, and I just got up, and I looked for the next tackle. Even if I was on the floor with a tackle, I'd reach my arm out just to make another tackle, and I'd come off, I'd come off the field, and immediately, I'd have a look at the tackle counts for everybody else in the league, because I wanted to be the top tackler. But it just overrides anything else. You know, intuition, your instincts as a rugby player. And I've argued this with performance analysis, particularly in football, guys who have said, yeah, but you just play on instinct. Well, these guys weren't. It was reshaping the way they were playing the game. Because remember, these were the accolades, these are the rewards which were stipulated by the management in the club. And in terms of dealing with it, one of Aristotle's three concepts is about phrenesis. It's about practical wisdom. And there was a huge shift from data and managing people through analytics to understanding people, to this social relationship, to have a, an excellent practical understanding and the rewards the culture it changed things flowered and the team had probably the best season they've had for a long time particularly on the back of what happened before and i leave you with this thought and thanks for listening because i think it applies to much of what we spoke to um, this morning So thanks for your time guys, we have got, if we go back to another round and so we think about those questions and maybe we'll wrap up then and we'll have five minutes. So if we have ten minutes guys, to think about some of what's been presented, but more importantly your own experiences guys, okay? This isn't a one way thing, this is about research and your context um, meeting really and that melting point we get some feedback in ten minutes. Alright guys, off you go. Thank you guys.